I'm Dixie Anderson with the World Affairs Council of Western Michigan, and I'd like to welcome all of you. Welcome to the fourth session of this year's Great Decisions, our award-winning discussion and lecture series. We'd like to thank our evening sponsors tonight, the Howenstein Center for Presidential Studies at Grand Valley State University, and Gleaves Whitney, the director, is here. Thank you, Gleaves. We appreciate your support. And the Thomas M. Cooley Law School. Of course, we thank Michigan Radio, our media sponsor. I'm shortening my housekeeping duties tonight, so may I steer you to the back of your program for information on how you may buy a Great Decisions book, how, why you should fill out a ballot, and also information on our armchair format, which we're using tonight. I'm still going, though, to take the time to urge you to become a member of the World Affairs Council. How many of you are members? See, look around. Look at almost everybody now, non-members. Don't you want to join those wonderful people? Because remember, we can't do it without our members. And you can join those, those wonderful folks for as little as $10 for our new email membership. And if you join tonight, your membership is only $5 because then your ticket only costs you $10, so we rebate you back that $5. And from now on, you receive all our membership pricing. Our membership here at the, our mission here at the council is to start the discussion with you on critical foreign policy or international issues. But we also want to continue that discussion even after our programs are over. So this is our, this is our deal. Please like us on Facebook and then join the Facebook discussion on every great decisions topic. So here's your chance to get mugged. Each week until the end of Great Decisions, we will draw a name from everyone who has liked us on Facebook that week and give that person one of these dandy mugs. How can, how can you resist that? Now to our program. With us tonight is Tom Garrett from the International Republican Institute. The IRI works in tandem with the National Democratic Institute around the world in developing countries. They help those countries build the infrastructure for democracy. Consider both groups nonpartisan NGOs. In fact, the last time the IRI was here, and that was in 2006, Tom, I, we were talking about that earlier, they did a joint program with the NDI. Both NGOs have been busy in recent weeks with the issues confronting them in Egypt, which I'm sure you've all heard about. We've asked Mr. Garrett to briefly update us on those issues, but then we've asked him to move to the larger conversation on how these organizations go into a developing country and start the process of democracy building. We've asked for some boots on the ground type of information about that process. So I, I think we're in for a fascinating discussion tonight. Gleaves Whitney, the director of the Howenstein Center for Presidential Studies, will be the moderator this evening. There will be ample time for your questions. Text them at any time to the number in your program or come on up to the mics when Gleaves open up for, opens up for questions. And don't be shy. Um, we're finding out that, um, you know, we're all from the Midwest, so we're all really polite. When people come down to the mics, they, they sit down because they don't want to bother anybody, but we're finding out the moderator and the speaker don't know you want to ask a question and don't realize anybody's there. So please just feel free to come up to the mic or text in your questions. So please join me in welcoming Mr. Garrett for his presentation, Promoting Democracy is in an America's Interest. Mr. Garrett. Thank you. May I have a glass of that water? May I have the water, please? Yes, let me get it for you. Uh, thank you, Dixie. It's a real pleasure to be with you uh, tonight. I'm going to speak with you for about uh, 15 minutes or so on the topics you mentioned, the idea of democracy promotion and whether it is in 
America's interest to do democracy support? Of course, I believe it is, and so that's the argument I'm going to make tonight, but I'd be interested in hearing your thoughts about it uh, when we go to the Q&A. I have a, a background in political science as well as uh, some years of service in the federal government, but I don't really want to speak to you today from a theoretical position, and I also don't want to speak to you from a governmental point of view, but instead what I'd like to do is talk to you as a democracy practitioner, as someone who works for the International Republican Institute, which is an NGO with programs in more than 75 countries. The events that we've seen over this last year or so in the Middle East uh, give us kind of a particular contemporary set of discussion points, I think, for tonight. So while I'm going to try to speak about places other than just the Middle East, and I'm happy to answer questions later about any parts of the world you might have a particular interest in, I am probably going to refer often to that region because as we look at the question of America's interests, democracy promotion, What's going on in the Middle East, I think, is giving us all a lot of great challenges at the moment. So I do believe it is in America's interest to support democracy overseas. Even though democracy is a, a difficult form of government to try to introduce or to try to support. It takes time for democracies to mature. And I think we've all seen transitions to democracy are often filled with uncertainty. And if you look back to the former Yugoslavia, it's even sometimes filled with violence. The short-term results from democracy transitions are not always encouraging. If we look at the Arab Spring over this last year, uh, Tunisia, Egypt have moved to elections. Libya will soon be having elections. And I think in almost every instance, we're going to see a former ally of the United States and President Mubarak, President Ben Ali of Tunisia, replaced by an elected government that is probably going to express some questions about the United States and its friendship. And I think most worrisome for the people in those countries, what we're going to see in the short term with elections, are we're going to see Islamist governments which don't have a tradition yet of pluralism and tolerance. I do hope that what we're going to see as time progresses, though, in these countries is what I saw when I was living and working in Indonesia with the Institute a few years ago, and that is Islamic parties that are on the outside are often perceived by people as they contrast it with an autocratic government and the Islamic parties. They're often seen as more pure and more, uh, less corrupt, more likely to do the right thing. Once they get into office, which we saw in Indonesia, Essentially, they govern like everyone else. And some of that glow gets taken off. Some of that shine gets taken off the idea that Islamists are better. So it may be in the long term what we've seen in Indonesia, some of the countries of South Asia, we'll see that in the Middle East. I think it's in America's long-term interest to support democracy overseas for three basic reasons. And that's what I want to talk to you about tonight. One is that democracies make for stronger and more stable partners for the United States. Secondly, I think support for democracy puts the United States at this time on the right side of history. And then thirdly, I think support for democracy reflects America's founding values. Uh, President Obama said last May that it is the policy of the United States to support transitions to democracy. And in that case, he was referring specifically to the Middle East. Before him, the national security strategy of the Bush administration said, it is the policy of the US to seek and support democratic movements in every nation and every culture. I think uh, bipartisan support for democracy promotion goes back really to Presidents Carter and Presidents Reagan, the two presidents who more or less launched the United States after Watergate, after the Vietnam War, onto a path of support for American values and foreign policy. When my institute, the International Republican Institute, and its parent organization, which is called the National Endowment for Democracy, were founded back in 1983, it was done by a joint action of the White House and the US Congress. Uh, we've been talking today uh, with various people here in the city, and everyone's asking, does the White House and Congress really do much together anymore? And I would say, look back to 1983. I, I don't think it goes all that way back, but that was a time when they worked together to create the National Endowment for Democracy, 
And yes, the National Democratic Institute, the International Republican Institute were founded at that time. I think one of the primary motivations for this broad and bipartisan support is that America has come to see that when it's looking at allies and partners overseas, the choice shouldn't have to be between stability and extremism. But that's very often what governments overseas want to present to the United States. They want to say it's either my autocratic rule and stability or it's the potential extremism that's going to come about through the ballot box. As an example, we'll probably be talking a little bit about Egypt tonight in various ways. But if you look over the decades, Washington has given billions of dollars of aid to the Egyptian government. Even as late as January a year ago, the US was still trying to find a way to support President Mubarak to remain in office, but to leave at the end of his term. Policymakers in Washington thought that the choice for the United States in dealing with Egypt, who's very important strategically in the Middle East, very important partner in the peace process with Israel, the choice was either Mubarak, stability, extremism, ballot box. So that was in our national interest, we thought, support for President Mubarak. But what do we have to show for that today? When the people of Egypt took to the streets to remove President Mubarak, he was gone in 18 days. So decades of American billions ended up meaning nothing as President Mubarak was swept from power by people who said, where was the United States with its values of democracy? In some cases, they understood what we were trying to do. But there's a lot of work to do in Egypt today to try to persuade them that we were standing with the people. We just wanted a peaceful transition. Uh, back in 2005, when I traveled to Pakistan and to Egypt to open up programs for our institute, one of the things I heard from almost everyone I met with was, we don't need you coming in to talk to us about democracy. What we need is you going back to Washington and persuading, at that time, President Bush to stop supporting President Musharraf and let us have democracy or stop supporting President Mubarak and let us have democracy. Uh, Secretary of State Clinton has pointed out that the greatest source of instability in the Middle East today isn't the result from the demand for change, but is the result of governments refusing to change. So again, my first point, I think democracy is made for stronger and stable partners. Because in a democracy, bad leaders are held accountable at the polls. People feel like they have a say in their government. If you look around, historically, America's closest allies have always been democracies. Another example I wanted to uh, mention to you, in 2009, Kyrgyzstan, which by that point had slid into a very autocratic, repressive pattern of governance. Kyrgyzstan uh, basically threw rights to the air base, Manas, <coughs> excuse me, Manas Air Base in Kyrgyzstan. They threw that open to the highest bidder. At that time, the US was using it as a critical supply station for American troops in Afghanistan. But the Kyrgyz government went to Moscow and they offered the base to them. Moscow offered $42 billion to take those rights away from Washington. Washington countered that by offering a tripling of its rent for the air base and an additional $100 million in aid. But I think more importantly, Washington turned a blind eye to the human rights abuses that were going on in the country as part of that deal. Less than a year later, protests in the country brought that government down. And an interim government took, place, uh, took power and expressed its sadness that the United States had not stood with them a year before when they were going through these human rights uh, repression and suppression. One interesting thing, our institute and the National Democratic Institute have been on the ground for many years in that country working with these very opposition figures. And when it came time for US policymakers and these people to sit down, IRI and NDI were very much a part of the process of bringing all the parties together. So what we see is that we see that autocracies, dictatorships, they're very stable until they're not. And I think uh, many of us in this room would remember the uh, fall of the Shah of Iran in 1979 as probably one of the better examples of that. But again, in the Arab Spring, we saw President Ben Ali, who had ruled Tunisia for 32 years, leave office in just one month of street protest. As I mentioned before, President Mubarak of Egypt left just 18 days after his 
countrymen took to the streets. So democracies are more stable. They're better partners to us. Secondly, US support for democracy puts it on the right side of history. Uh, surveys indicate that a sizable majority of citizens throughout the countries of the developing world prefer the idea of living in a society with free access to information and the right to organize in political parties, the right to participate in free elections. Organization does a lot of public opinion research around the world. And one of the things that we find is that the 10 top issues people care about are pretty much all the same from the United States to you name the country. Sometimes the priority people put them in is different. You'll find sometimes in Asian countries, the community is put higher than the individual. Or, um, yeah, again, the community might be higher placed in priority than the family. But very definitely, those 10 top issues with just a little bit of variance are all the same. People want to be safe in their homes. They want to have the right to have a business. They want to have the right to educate their children. Um, in the mid-1980s, two out of five countries in this world were democratic. But by the mid-1990s, after the fall of the Berlin Wall, three out of five countries in this world have democratic processes underway. If you look over these last few years, some 90 countries have made a transition to democracy. And it's not just the United States who sees democracy promotion as being on the right side of history. Right now, IRI works with uh, political party institutes similar to ours from Denmark, from Germany, uh, from the Netherlands, from England, uh, the Scandinavian countries, as well as the formerly communist countries of Eastern Europe, like Poland, the Czech Republic, and Slovakia. So there is a right side to um, history, and I believe that that side is democracy. And then thirdly, uh, support for democracy reflects American values. I know that some of you here today participate in the uh, Great Decisions program that Dixie referred to, and that you've studied this issue. Um, People who have studied this issue often come to me with John Adams' comments about the fact that America affirms and applauds democracy, but it doesn't go abroad in search of it, that we basically mind our own business. But I would just say at the time of his thinking, recall, America was the only democracy then. Something very different now is we see 90 nations around the world trying to make this transition to democracy. So I'd agree, we don't go looking for dictatorships to overthrow out there but we try to support homegrown movements that have made the stand themselves. I was uh, just in Libya a few weeks ago, and I think there is a perfect example of a country where democracies, young democracies don't know how to run themselves. Uh, Muammar Gaddafi had governed for 42 years, and he had made certain that all political parties, all civil society had been driven out of power, uh, driven out of existence. As a matter of fact, if you joined an NGO in Libya, that was a uh, crime punishable by execution under the Gaddafi government. So IRI has gone in there. We met with various uh, Libyan political activists. We met with women activists, political parties. And they all basically said, what do we do? We have elections, but what's that next step? So, I talk about democracy promotion, and I've talked about how it, to me, is an American imperative, and it's something that would benefit our foreign policy. But I want to talk a little bit here, just for a moment, about what does it mean to do democracy promotion, because that's kind of a vague uh, notion, I think, to a lot of us. And so I thought what I might do is I just wanted to show you a few images here of actually how we do something in a country. In 2005, IRI opened up offices in Egypt, and we did that because for the first time in decades, President Mubarak was going to stand for election, not as a referendum, do you want Hosni Mubarak or not to be president, but he actually was going to allow people to run against him for the first time. So we decided that was a good opportunity for us to go in and try to work with all of the parties that were participating in the election. And we went into the country, we worked through that first election, but by 2006, President Mubarak's government had gotten tired of the work of IRI and NDI, and they told us basically, you can't work in this country any longer. So we took all of our Egyptian friends that were seeking support for democratic training, and we moved them 
overseas. We took them for the weekend to Jordan, to Dubai, to Morocco, and we did training programs for them. And I just want to show you a few pictures from that. Well, first, let me say democracy promotion. There are five basic things that we do at the International Republican Institute, five basic fields that we focus on, political party development, democratic governance, civil society initiatives, election monitoring, and civic education. And in Egypt, we're active in four of these five. What we're not active in in Egypt is democratic governance because it was only a few weeks ago that they elected their first democratic government, so it's the early stages. As I said, we had to take our Egyptian friends out of the country. From 2007 to 2010, we were able to take about 1,300 Egyptians to various nations around the Middle East and provide weekend training in settings really similar to this. So these folks are being trained on being local candidates. These are all Egyptian activists. The man in the middle is an American trainer who's volunteered his time. He's a very prominent American political consultant who charges a fortune to an American to work. But he goes and does this for free as a volunteer. These are folks at the same training. It's very practical, hands-on training. You see the woman below is preparing campaign slogans that she's then going to test on the people uh, at the seminar. One of the other things we did is we brought Egyptians over the years to the United States to observe elections here. Uh, one of the things they always take away is they're always surprised at how many senior citizens participate in running the elections. That's what they always say to me after every time they come is all of the folks are, are seniors that do this. Uh, the upper picture shows Senator John McCain with a group of uh, younger Egyptians who came to see elections. Senator McCain is the chairman of our institute. Madeleine Albright, the former Secretary of State, is the chairman of the Democratic Institute. Here at the lower picture, these are Egyptian civil society activists and I think one or two political party folks and they're there with a voting machine and this is in, I think, Maryland. So I said that we were able to do training of about 1,200 Egyptians outside of the country from 2007 until 2010. Then in late 2010, December 2010, January 2011, the Arab Spring occurred. I was able to travel into Egypt in February while the revolution was still really underway. And people said to us, you can't keep doing these programs overseas. We need more of them here in our country now. And the demand was great. And so from February 2011 until December 2011, we were able to train almost 10,000 Egyptians who came to our programs that we conducted inside the country. So you can see that the demand was great for this kind of activity. Our democratic counterpart also in Egypt was doing pretty much the same numbers. The uh, gentleman in the blue blazer, again, it's an American political consultant on communications who volunteered his time to go to Egypt, and he's teaching the Egyptian candidates on the left how to do a stump speech, how to do the three-minute speech when you walk up and you meet a voter and you tell them why you want to run for office. This picture, it's a little bit blurry on the uh, left side, but I wanted to show you this in particular. This, these are women who wanted to run for the first time in the elections uh, this last December. The woman in the striped shirt in both pictures is a volunteer uh, consultant to IRI from Austin, Texas. But the woman on the left is wearing a cross. I'm not sure if you can quite see that. And so she is a Coptic Christian. She's at the same training with a woman who's wearing traditional Islamic clothing. And that's one of the points I wanted to make was that IRI is not in there choosing to work only with religious parties or non-religious parties, pro-American parties, we're in there working with all the actors who want to be a part of democracy. It's not the role of our institutes to choose winners or to choose favorites, but basically to support the institution of democracy building. These are young people who are being taught social media uh, programs. And then the training can take place in the fairly large settings or it can take place in the fairly small settings. The uh, man in the white shirt on the far right is actually one of the IRI staff who has been uh, 
charged with crimes in Egypt and is one of the people that you've been hearing about that could face imprisonment for sitting around and talking about uh, democracy and communications with a group of Egyptian activists. The woman in the center is someone who has done a great number of volunteer activities for IRI all over the world. The woman with the red hair. She is Leslie Waters and she is a state legislator in Florida. And I've seen her go all over the world to Indonesia, to Latin America, to try to get more women involved in politics. And um, one interesting thing about this woman, her name Leslie Waters, Representative Waters, uh, her campaign activity back in the United States at a rally like this is to do the wave, the Waters wave, she likes to call it. And I've seen her being able to get people doing it all over the world. And it's amazing. It's a great icebreaker. But uh, anyway, this is her. Those were just a few of the pictures um, I wanted you to see so you could see sort of what it is we're talking about. We're not talking about things at 30,000 feet. We're talking about democracy promotion the way it's done by groups like IRI and NDI as something very much person to person, bringing volunteers from one country to another country to share ideas and to share advice. And so with that, I want to go ahead and take your questions and answers and have Mr. Whitney join us. So thank you. Tom, thank you for those comments. Very instructive, very insightful. I'm not sure many Americans really know how such organizations work. And I thought that the first question would be to ask you how a country gets on your radar screen. What's the triggering event that means that your organization will actually go into a country, help out, and then as part two of that, um, take us a little bit through you know, the, the processes, and then part three, when do you know that a, a country has been successful enough from your all's point of view that you could then pull back? And before he answers, I want to reiterate something that Dixie had, had mentioned. Please, because of the, the lights right in our eyes here, when you come up to the microphones with your questions, please stand at the microphones so it's easy to see you. That'll help us a lot. Feel free to text. Feel free to come up to the microphones while we're asking these first few questions. I think uh, I, I've worked at our institute for 17 years, and 11 of those were spent overseas doing this kind of work. I returned in 2005 to head up our Middle East division, and now I'm the vice president for global programs. So I have sort of a long-term perspective at IRI. But one of the things I have found over 17 years is people say, you know, what do you not literally, but figuratively parachute in and, and start talking about democracy and start you know, lighting fires and planting seeds and all of this. And I think that's an important thing to understand is that we are not talking about bringing in and even introducing American ideas of democracy. We are responding to homegrown indigenous aspirations for democracy that take place. So very often we will go into a country that has seen something like in Tunisia a year ago when President Ben Ali was suddenly overthrown by the young people in his country. We'll go in there and we'll do an assessment to see is there anything that we even have to offer to the people of this uh, country. We tell them a little bit about what we've done, they tell us a little bit about what they hope for, and then you know, there are places where I have done this, uh, these type of assessment missions where we have not worked. Uh, we've just decided we don't possess the skill sets or we have decided there's really nothing for us to do in this location. So it's not a given that we're going to be there. Uh, but that's more or less how we find our way in there. There's really only a few places in this world where the government in place absolutely doesn't want us around. And that would be North Korea, Cuba, uh, Syria. And in those places, we are actually working with exiled opposition groups as they plan for the day that they go back in. And I think we've seen changes in all those countries coming. So hopefully some one day are going to be back home. 
Um, we go into a country, usually with US government funding, uh, and a few very rare instances since I arise received money from private sources, and we've received money from multilateral groups like the United Nations. But for the most part, we are going in, funded by the US government through its US Agency for International Development, or by the State Department, because it's been identified as a US policy goal to support the democratic transition underway in that country. And then you know, you don't ever really, it's the third part of your question, uh, how do you know when it's time to go? Um, we have left countries where we thought we weren't making an, a difference. We've also left countries that, uh, you know, the countries of the former Soviet Union, most of those countries today are not actually recipients of IRI training. They actually are partners to IRI in all of these countries. In Egypt right now, there are people from uh, five, six, seven different countries alongside the Americans being charged with supporting democracy in Egypt. Uh, but democracy is not something you achieve, it's something you strive for. And so uh, we leave a country for a number of different reasons, but we don't leave one because it's graduated. Now, surely you have a, a number of countries that you think did successfully establish democracy. And at lunch, we were talking about a number of, of interesting examples. Would you give this audience an example of a particularly successful test case? You know, there's um, a number of countries, I think, in the former Eastern Europe, Central and Eastern Europe, that sort of fit this bill. And it's interesting, when you go to those countries today, if you go to the Czech Republic, you often will meet people saying, I don't know why our country is supporting democracy. We still don't have these streets fixed. Or we still don't have the best people in our government. And you know, they're, they're surprised when they find out Americans don't believe our government's perfect and finally set. But uh, some have definitely made great strides. Uh, you know, uh, I would say probably uh, Slovakia, Poland. Poland has done a lot to try to support activists both at the individual level, human rights dissidents, but also they've done a lot of things to try to support governments at large. Just before I got here, uh, I received an email from someone in Washington. 17 foreign ministers, former foreign ministers, have produced a uh, communique today calling upon the Egyptian government to free the NGO workers that are being held. And these are all people that once upon a time were recipients of this type of training, and now they're out there backing this training. And you mentioned Ukraine as a particularly successful example also. Ukraine uh, went through, you recall, the Orange Revolution a few years ago. And while at that time it was a successful revolution in that people finally tired of uh, the government so blatantly stealing elections, and all the various elements of civil society work together. The judges had been trained by the American Bar Association. The media had been trained by Internews, which is a US-based media freedoms program. Uh, IRI and NDI had trained domestic observers as well as political party activists. All of the things were there, and so we were very excited to see what happened in Ukraine in 1994. Today, uh, things are a little bit tougher in Ukraine. Uh, they're affected by the worldwide economy as well, too. But uh, that is a place where I think you can see uh, a lot of the success of this kind of work. What do you think is the impact of an American election year, such as we're having right now, 2012, when people are looking to the United States for leadership and democracy? And of course, we're very critical of what's happening in our own country. But it must have an impact as they're looking at us. Could you describe that impact? I would say the, uh, I was living in Indonesia in 2000 when we went through the uh, Florida situation here in the United States. And it was interesting because during the day uh, you would get phone calls from Indonesian political activists saying, congratulations, you have a president. And then a short while later calling back saying, we're confused, your courts have changed. And so it was interesting back and forth. One of the takeaways, you know, and we were thinking, now we're going to stand this next weekend and tell people how we do it in the United States. And it was interesting, as people said, we never saw tanks in your street. Uh, we didn't see the people taking to the streets, and I know there were some people who wanted to, but uh, for the most part, we had a process that worked its way through. 
Um, what I find right now is that maybe it will change when there's a Republican candidate against President Obama for election. But at the moment, they're not looking overseas so much at our electoral process as much as they're looking at our governance process. And I think they're perturbed by what they see. Uh, I think the uh, budget issues and the failure of the Congress and the White House to work together has actually caused a lot of people overseas to say, if it can't work there, where is it going to work? You know, they see us as a, a finished final product, and they don't see us as a work in progress. Something about that old expression of Churchill's being the messiest form right. of government until you compare it to all, all the others. others. What do you think, Tom, when you, we just talked about perhaps some of the stumbling blocks right here in the United States, and I, I know there are going to be some questions yeah. about this. Uh, I'd be curious about our whole foreign policy establishment perhaps tripping on itself as we try to assist other countries. But what about, in your view, say the two or three largest obstacles to democracy initiation and democracy building in the world today? I think a lot of the, uh, one of the number one changes I see when you move into a country and you start to work in support of the democratic transition that has started there is the lack of democratic traditions in the past. Uh, Eastern Europe, the countries of the former Soviet Union, you may recall that between the world wars, many of them had short-lived republics. Many of them were democracies for a brief period of time until they got caught up in the Second World War and then under Soviet uh, domination. But very often when you work in Ukraine in the 1990s or in uh, Lithuania, grandmother remembered a democracy. They had family members who remembered democracy. They had archives. They had things that said, we were a democracy once and we can do that again. But you go to a place like Libya where Muammar Gaddafi has eradicated all evidence of that. It's a desert in many ways and it's a desert for democracy. And it's starting from nothing. So. The idea of having past traditions, uh, we were speaking today at lunch about how I think Americans don't fully grasp just how totally surrounded you are by the notion of representative democracy. And that we take it, not for granted, but it's something that we assume in many parts of our daily life doesn't exist in a lot of these countries overseas. Um, as they start to make the transition, it has to grow really from seedlings. Um, Another challenge, and I think we're seeing this right now a year into the Arab Spring, and that is the backlash from people who don't want democracy, who benefited from decades before uh, without democracy. You know, when you look at Egypt right now, people are aware that my organization is facing trouble, and so is the Democratic Institute of Washington. But what you may not see as often in the media is 400 Egyptian organizations are also being pulled through this process and are being threatened with imprisonment, with fines, with being shut down. So I think what you have to look at going on in Egypt is a backlash to democracy. And there are some countries in this world who, uh, Russia being one, where the backlash is you know, very strong. So that's another challenge to the idea of democracy. Um, and I would say probably those two are the key things that I've encountered myself. Okay, very good. <clears throat> As you know, we've had a tortuous experience in Iraq. Mm -hmm. More than 4,400 service people dead and a lot of billions of dollars spent. What's your assessment of democracy in Iraq at this point? Uh, I think to do uh, the work of democracy promotion as an NGO worker, um, you have to be an optimist and you have to always think the glass is half full uh, as opposed to half empty. And so I do have hopes for Iraqi democracy, but it's very difficult at the moment. If you look at the uh, northern portion of Iraq, Kurdistan, which actually has been operating in a democratic transition for a much longer period than the rest of Iraq, you may remember in the first Gulf War, uh, since the time of the first Gulf War, Kurdistan has had a no-fly zone that protected it from Saddam. Hussein, it's a very different place than the rest of Iraq, and it gives you some hope that in another 10 years, things may be better for Iraq itself. There are wonderful groups of women in that country that are working to try to preserve their rights. There are political parties who say we're Iraqis, not we're Shia, we're Sunni, we're Assyrian, we're Christian. 
you know, there are those, you can see those hopes for a greater uh, Iraqi democracy. But when we speak about Iraq and about Afghanistan, one of the points I probably want to make, I think I mentioned in my comments, some 90 countries in the last few years have made transitions to democracy. So, and they did that without military intervention as in Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, it may be that military intervention is just not the way to do it. Well, I think we have somebody who has a question here. I would encourage more of you to come up to the microphones. This is not a time to be bashful. Uh, we have somebody who's so knowledgeable, but yes, that's it, okay. <laughs> Any more encouragement? Um, thank you. So let's start with our first question from the floor. My, my question is, your, your, one of your initial premises was that democracy is stronger and more stable partners for the U.S. And my question is, when you look at what's happening and has happened in the Middle East, and I'll use Hamas as an example, mm -hmm. there was an election, as Democrat as an election as they're going to have, right. and the U.S. says, we don't go by that. We, we discount a democratic process. You look at Egypt, where you may have the Brotherhood winning a democratic election. The U.S. isn't going to go by that. We'll say, not fair. We do not approve that they're terrorist groups. So my question really is, what is democracy? Is it free elections, or is it a valid court system? Okay, thank you. Um, the election uh, in the West Bank in Gaza, where Hamas did so well, was 1995. In the U.S. at that time, excuse me, 2005. Uh, and the U.S. at that time refused to work with Hamas, you're right. I think we've learned lessons from that time because you see now the US is working with the Muslim Brotherhood and the Egyptian parliament. So we, I think, have come to realize that it is the determination of peoples to decide for themselves who they're going to elect. I would say back to that Hamas election, uh, there was some question as to whether or not they actually were the you know, they won in kind of a convoluted system that caused a lot of uh, funny endings that we might not have had in a straight up and down election. So there was some question about that. But I think you see in Tunisia, which has had its elections and had an Islamist party win, Egypt, the United States has learned those lessons and is going to be more accepting of these short-term results. Long-term results, I think, are going to be different. And so that is something we have to look for, but it is for the people of these uh, countries to decide. So what is democracy? Uh, when I think we in the United States look at democracy, we look at a whole set of liberal values that are attached to it. But I think right now in the Middle East, you know, this is a young transition that's just begun. People look at democracy and they simply see it as representative government which is a huge change from what they've had for the last four decades. And over time, it will mature, and over time, the judges will become a counterbalance to the legislative. The parliament only went in, I think, a few weeks ago, so we've got to give it some time. Patience is not much of an American virtue, but it is something that's called for in this case. Our second question from the floor. Hi, thanks for coming. Um, in the study guide, it um, references the Peace of Westphalia um, in 1648, where um, the sovereignty of nations is a long-standing legal foundation that is um, part of the basis of civilization. Mm -hmm. And so how, in a situation like Syria, do you square, or anywhere else for that matter, the um, that concept in the law with um, the wish to promote democracy? Uh, for us at IRI, again, as an NGO, not operating as an official government body, but operating as an NGO, uh, some years back, Syrian activists came to us and said, you know, what can you do to help us? And so we've looked at a number of things through the years with Syria. We've tried to help them learn advocacy, uh, learn how to form NGOs around such things as infant health or environmental protections. And those are skills that later they'll be able to use in democracy. So, you know, you start to teach the ideas of accountable government, transparency, and then those will eventually maybe one day lead to something bigger. 
Um, but we are an NGO, so we're, we're people, able to work with people. And Syria doesn't want us, Damascus doesn't want us working in the country, and so we're therefore not there. But I think such things as, uh, you know, the peace of, West, the, of Westphalia doesn't really affect us since the time of that, and I don't remember the year. Uh, 1648. 1648. Um, we've moved on to the idea of the notion of people-to-people -people communication and contact, and you hear a lot about that now. The idea the United Nations has enshrined this. Secretary Clinton's referred to this idea of the free exchange of ideas in this globalized world, the movement of ideas and sharing of people back and forth. So we're approaching this as an NGO working with people seeking our assistance in Syria. You're making a face. Does that not answer your question? <laughs> well, two thoughts. Uh -huh. um, first thought, Syria is not the only place that that's an issue True. for us. And um, the second thought is I thought I heard you say that you're funded by USAID, which is our government funding. And so you're sort of in a quasi-partnership, okay. and I wonder how that reads in the birds. Sure. We uh, are not funded in Syria by the U.S. government, though that is one of the places where we have outside money. So that's somewhat different. So we aren't funded by U.S. government in Syria the way we are in Egypt or the way we are in some other countries. Um, you know, the difference between a Syria and a Libya, I think, is really the United Nations decided last year there was something called the responsibility to protect. You may recall, and that's why they're in, and I can tell you when I was in Libya a few weeks ago, people in Libya were saying, you know, we don't know why NATO helped us and you're not helping there, but we're glad you did. Tell the American people, thank you. But they're puzzled, why us and not them? And I know that people in the region will say to me, why Libyans and not Palestinians. Uh, so one of the things I think you often see in the whole field of democracy promotion is the idea of competing interests. We said democracy promotion, is that in America's interest? Well, yes it is, but I do recognize there are other interests. Egypt's a place that we've seen a lot of these. Right now, Egypt's military receives $1.3 billion a year from the United States. But that's not just a gift of kindness from us, that is part of the peace process to ensure that they remain at peace with Israel, the Camp David Accords. And now the Congress is saying, unless you free these NGO workers, we're going to cut off that money. So you see there's a lot of different competing interests going on there. And I think what we need to try to do, and what I encourage our government to do, is to try to find a way to align those interests when they can but recognize that, you know, when it comes down to it, IRI and NDI, we're going to be pushed down to number 12, 13, 14, or even lower on the issue list. Um, so I'm still probably not exactly where I'm supposed to be with you, but hopefully I'm getting there. Okay, thanks. We have a question from this side of the floor, they, sir. They've been in line quite a lot. Okay, thank you. Hi. Um, Hi. IRI has a very particular method in the way it promotes democracy, and I know you mentioned that armed conflict is, while a different form of promoting democracy may not be the best form. I was wondering if you could expand on that a little bit, and then also mention if there are other ways of promoting democracy that may be better, um, because the U.S. has many different types of promoting democracy. Well, I think... Um 90 or so countries that have made that democratic transition, I guess off the top of my head I think of, in the last few decades, five that were the result of military intervention by the U.S., and that would be uh, all the way back to Grenada, uh, Panama, I guess maybe you might say that about parts of the former Yugoslavia, uh, Iraq, and Afghanistan. But then there are the others, the other 85 that have made that as a result of people in that country saying we want democracy as opposed to some outside force. You know, I'd have to say that in those five instances, in no case was democracy promotion the reason military intervention came about. There were other factors. But rather than leaving those countries to another strong man that would eventually lead us back into the same situation, the idea was 
will try to encourage the idea of democracy in these countries, as we did in the Second World War with Germany and Japan. Um, democracy promotion, really, it, it can't be exported. It can't be imposed. It has to come from within the country. And so um, that's really where it has to start. The fight belongs to the people of Tunisia. The fight belongs to the people of Egypt. It doesn't belong to Americans and international NGOs to bring it to them. It's just we have seen in a place like Iran in 1979 when people overthrow a despot. If we don't try to provide support to the democratic elements in that country, what might come is even worse than what was there before. And we've seen that with the Shah of Iran, excuse me, with the Ayatollah, and with the governance in Iran now. It's a striking fact, five out of 90 only. Yeah. That is striking. Jason? Thanks, please. Um, Mr. Gary, you mentioned North Korea briefly. Um, a few months ago, the, the leader, or the dear leader, or the maximum leader, or whatever leader he was, died. Uh, and it seemed like the world, the international community's main interest in that was, including our own U.S. government, to ensure a peaceful transition to his son, who was the newest dictator and tyrant in North Korea. Um, this would be definitely in the easier said than done category, but is there anything that your group or the United States can do to, is there any ray of hope at all for the people of North Korea who face this awful dictatorship? I think North Korea is an ex excellent example of uh, competing interest. Mm -hmm. Is the U.S. desire primarily to secure the nuclear weapons that we are concerned about there? Mm -hmm. Is it to help the starving people of the, or is it to bring democracy, I mean, which one of those three, or is it to protect South Korea mm -hmm. and Japan? So that's a perfect example of these competing interests are not always in line with one another. Mm -hmm. The IRI program is uh, very modest. Uh, it's another one not supported by U.S. government directly mm -hmm. all the time. Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. And we work with uh, North Koreans who have been able to leave the country mm. and have set up their communities in South Korea. And we are just talking to them about the idea of how to organize themselves, how to prepare themselves for one day when they might be able to return. Good, great, thank you. Sure. So we have a question from the gentleman on this side of the room. I was wondering if there are likes or dislikes, similarities or dissimilarities as to these policies and efforts in the Islamic countries, which has had gotten so much interest, versus non-Islamic countries. Thank you. <clears throat> Could you tell me a little bit more? I'm not sure I quite get it. Well, <clears throat> that enters as to, um, um, let, just to be very honest, let's say religion and Islamic religious uh, uh, beliefs, practices, uh, versus, um, <clears throat> let's just say, uh, uh, Catholicism in South America. Okay. Um, I'm sure in this room, uh, in this setting, there have to be political scientists somewhere. And some of you that are political scientists may remember that uh, for a while there was a popular trend in political science that democracy was really, representative government was, uh, really belonged to Northern European Protestants. And that Latins and Catholics were ill-suited to the idea of democracy because of the authoritarianism of the church and the Cadillo system in South America. And you know, today, of course, <clears throat> we reject that idea that there's a difference between the two cultures as far as being able to see self-governance and representative government. And I think it's really the same in uh, Islam. In Islam today, there is not, in political Islam, I should be clear, I mean political Islam, there is not a tradition of pluralism. There is not a tradition of uh, the same level of concern that we've seen develop in maybe uh, Western democracies for individual rights. But that's something that I think is going to grow with time. Uh, if you look at some of the largest democracies in the world today are Islamic, Indonesia, uh, one of the largest countries in the world, and very strongly an Islamic country. That's a place that shows it can work. And I'm very glad to say the Indonesians actually 
very quickly <clears throat> stepped up to the plate and they started to uh, support dem democratic training programs like this in the uh, Islamic world. One of the things that you see in the uh, Muslim nations, <clears throat> we see that with Indonesia after the 30 years of the New Order government, and you see that with uh, President Ben Ali in Tunisia, is these uh, dictatorships to control religion, they're often very aggressively secular. So when you see a dictator in a Muslim majority country overthrown, you can almost guarantee yourself that you're going to start to see this wave of religious expression taking place. In Tunisia, right after President Ben Ali left, Tunisia, where women's rights are probably, <clears throat> excuse me, the most enshrined in all of the Middle East, women started wearing traditional head coverings. <clears throat> excuse me. And people said, aren't you concerned? Don't you think you know, radical Islamism is taking over? No, it's really not that. It's that people have been forced for the last several decades to suppress their natural religious instincts. Uh, <clears throat> Indonesians were the same way. They became more religious after the fall of President Suharto, but they didn't necessarily become more Islamist. So it is a slightly different dynamic, but it's not <clears throat> a dynamic where democracy can't flourish. One of our leadership fellows at the Hallenstein Center for Presidential Studies, Christine. Hello, Cleves. Uh, you have mentioned both at lunch and today the importance of um, representative democracy and how it's just ingrained in the U.S. society and becomes ingrained in us. What I'm wondering is as you go into these other countries, do you find that you need to try to express that and teach that within their cultures, in their mindsets, to try to push them towards that? Or have you not found that necessary? And if you have found it necessary to try to push the culture, how do you go about pushing the culture? Well, in the early 1990s, when, we, when I started working in Ukraine, um, I mentioned you have to be an optimist to do this job to some extent because I probably spent every weekend for every weekend of every month for 10, 11 months out of every year for four years being told after you spend three days doing these big presentations and teaching plans and Someone standing up saying, that was all very nice, but it won't work here. And you had to really get used to that rejection. You know, our American trainers who would fly overseas, and you know, many of them never held a passport before they came on an IRI mission. And they would work through translators, and they'd try their hardest to share the things that had made them a success back in the US. And then someone stands up and says, it doesn't work here. And so, it doesn't work right away, but it does with time, and it does if you keep pressing. And people, you sit in a room of uh, 40 Ukrainian political party activists, and maybe a dozen of them really give you a hard time for three days about how this doesn't work. But there's also about eight who are quiet. And those eight are the ones that, you know, a decade later are in the parliament or in the cabinet or heads of parties. And they're figuring out how does this work in our context? You know, you can't take an American political consultant and have them go to a poor country and teach fundraising. They can't come in and say, do a celebrity golf tournament. Uh, do, you know, <clears throat> but you can come in and talk to them about the idea of people don't give because they've never been asked. And don't just ask them for money if they're poor. Ask them to give time. Ask them to give of themselves. Ask them to sign something saying, you know, they agree with you. And so it's just finding a way uh, of adapting. Uh, when I say that uh, surveys show that people have all the 10 basic issues they all care about, you know, one of the things is they want political parties and they want elected officials to talk to them and they want to be listened to in return. So it's just finding a way to adapt it to a particular culture. You speculated about a political scientist in the auditorium. The one has materialized from Grand Valley. <laughs> Professor Divin. Hi. Um, I'm really curious about your organization. I'm still trying to wrestle a little bit with this issue about being a non-government organization, but you get almost all your money from the government. <clears throat> so I'm really trying to figure out what, uh, here's my big question. Why do we have to have a Democratic one and a Republican one? I mean, why are the parties separate? <clears throat> if you're all about promoting democracy, why does it have to be a Republican institute and a National Democratic Institute, 
is it because you only send Republican political consultants and they only send Democratic political consultants? Like you selling, do you send Mary Matlin and they send James Carville? Or I, I'm sort of trying to figure out what your organizations really do and what the tax dollars that we all contribute to the organizations go for. I don't want to be rude, I'm just trying to get a handle sure. on it all. Um, <clears throat> Uh, back in 1983, when the National Endowment for Democracy was created, it was created to support democratic aspirations as they were occurring around the world. A study was done at that time, back in 1983, that said, and it was guiding the Congress and the White House as they were piecing this endowment together. And this endowment actually had bipartisan opposition as well as bipartisan support. Uh, Ron Paul was never for this idea, and he's still not for this idea today. <laughs> and neither is his son, the senator from Kentucky. But others have changed through time. I can remember congressmen saying to me at various times, I voted against the NED, NED, the National Endowment for Democracy. And I just was in uh, Country X, and I just can't believe the good work that's being done there. So there's that. But in 1983, a study was done that said American political uh, thought or American political culture can best be understood through four main streams of thought, the two-party system, the labor movement, and small business. And so it was decided that when the endowment was created, there would be four institutes that implemented this work. So there's a Republican Institute, Democratic Institute, an institute that's affiliated with uh, the AFL-CIO, and one that is aligned with the Chamber of, U.S. Chamber of Commerce. And uh, we now know that there's much more to American political thought than that. There's human rights, and groups like Freedom House deal with that. There's uh, a free media, the role of a free media in democracy. And so there's Internews, a group I mentioned, I think, a few minutes ago. The American Bar Association does rule of law work. So we know now there's a lot more to it, but we were sort of the first four. Uh, that were founded as a result of this study. Uh, so we were created to do this work. IRI pretty much focused right away on the idea of Latin America, our own backyard. NDI at the time was really focused on the solidarity movement in Poland. That was one of their first big activities. Uh, in those early days, we often worked in different countries doing different things. But now we're both, for instance, in Egypt. Uh, we both were in Indonesia while I was there. Uh, our work is complementary, and we try to divide it up so that it's not duplicative. You really can't tell the difference between an IRI training manual and an NDI training manual because we're both calling upon the neutral technology of the United States. That is, communications isn't Republican or Democrat. Good communications is just good communications, political communications. Uh, but typically the way it works in most places, the National Democratic Institute likes to work at the national parliamentary level, and IRI likes to work with their version of state legislatures. Uh, NDI likes to work with domestic observers in a country, pe training people to be election observers. IRI likes to organize international observer missions. Uh, NDI does something called parallel vote counts on election day, in which they are trying to be a watchdog on the elections. IRI does a lot of public opinion research. So we've sort of developed specialties over time, but when we both go into a country, it's always worked out in advance who's going to be doing what so that we're not duplicating each other's work. The question of the idea of why are there two, that comes about a lot. And actually, England has a single foundation for all of its parties. Whereas the German, Insti the, uh, Germany, not only has any faction in parliament has an institute, those institutes only work overseas with parties that mirror them ideologically. Uh, the Swedish party institutes do the same thing. And actually both of them are sort of looking at maybe changing to be more like IRI and NDI. And that is once we leave this nation's borders, we don't actually look for right of center or left of center. We just work with democratic players. So. Uh, as to why, you know, it's just the way we were structured. John McCain is our chairman. Madeleine Albright is chairman of the Democratic Institute. But um, the two of them work together very, very closely. 
on issues like Egypt, on China, uh, and it's actually just a much more collegial process than a competitive process. I think we have some text messages that have come in. Dr. Amy Richards? Sure, yes, we have um, six questions came in. We won't have time for all those, so I'm just going to group um, three of them that are, are very similar to, together. And, um, one came in from Susan Roberts, one of the World Affairs members, and she asks, um, many countries have a large illiterate population. Can democracies work without an educated population? Then I'm going to add to this, um, two, these next two go together. So what has been the greatest tool supporting the growth of democracy in the Middle East? And then somebody asked, what was the role of social media, um, yeah. communication technology in that? <coughs> um, in a place like Afghanistan, even in Egypt in these recent uh, parliamentary elections, uh, you, had a lot of, you have a lot of illiterate voters. And so the way the ballot has to be structured is the parties all have to have symbols. And what you often find in a first election after a country goes through transition, the gates are thrown wide open. Uh, and there can be 200 political parties. And in Ukraine, I think in the first elections, there were 300. Everything from the Beer Lovers Party to Socialist Parties to anyone could have a party, basically. And you know, you really have to do that. When political space opens up, you, know, you just got to let everyone do their thing. But they have to have symbols because most, many people can't read the names and can't read the party name. And so the, in our political party training, that's one of the things we train them on is, you know, does all of your party literature have your symbol on it? And often it didn't. You know, it's just the basics that you try to share with people. But what we primarily try to do when we address illiterate, illiteracy as an issue in trying to get people to the polls is we work with organizations in the country that that is their primary focus is working with illiteracy. And we try to support them to develop voter education, uh, television spots, things that will bring illiterate voters into the system. When Afghanistan had its election in 2004, it had a very thick ballot. And one of the things, IRI took the ballot to, a uh, sample ballot to the countryside and tested it, and you found that illiterate voters would open the first page and look at it, and that was it. That they didn't get the idea they were supposed to keep turning pages to see the other choices. Uh, it really is a tremendous challenge what people who have never voted in a free and fair election often are faced with in their first free and fair election. Uh, this idea of, you know, will I get beaten by the police if I go there? Who do I vote for? Who are all these parties? There's 300 parties on the ballot. Uh, so it's really quite impressive to see a first election take place. But working with, uh, we've worked for instance in Egypt and in Uganda with disabilities groups because that's one of the things you often find is that uh, you might have to go up that number of steps right there to vote in the ballot box and what happens for people with disabilities. And actually, I think uh, a lot of the countries that we're working in are making great strides in making balloting accessible to illiterate voters as well as to uh, disabled voters. Let's see, you asked about what's the greatest uh, our facilitator and the uh, and that would probably have been social media, but also satellite television. And it was Al Jazeera, I think, in particular, played a major role in what happened in the Arab Spring. And if you look back to the events of the Arab Spring a year ago, those governments were attacking Al Jazeera offices as frequently as they were attacking political opposition offices. So uh, in Tunisia in particular, uh, the WikiLeaks, which, you know, people in Washington hate WikiLeaks, and they hate for us to ever say there was a positive role to anything about WikiLeaks. But in reality, the people of Tunisia thought the U.S. was so firmly behind President Ben Ali that when they read the U.S. ambassador's cable in WikiLeaks saying, this is the most appalling thing I've ever seen in my life, the way the Ben Ali family conducts itself, that was one of the real impetus to young people to say if the Americans can't stand this guy, you know, we thought Washington was going to back him up all the way. So it's uh, really interesting. WikiLeaks triggered a lot of this. Social media provided the organizing tool 
and then Al Jazeera showed people the excesses of the government, so in, in striking against demonstrators. So that was really, uh, I think, what did it. What we are now finding out, there was a referendum in Egypt on the new constitution. Uh, well, actually on the rules that would govern the body that creates the constitution. And the young people who were active a year ago in bringing down the Mubarak government said, let's take to Facebook and organize voters. And they found out it doesn't really work in an election process. So social media got people in the streets, but it got no one to the polls. And so they're having to learn now you go back and basically roll up your shirt sleeves and go out and shake hands with voters. A Hallenstein Center Leadership Fellow gets to ask the last question. Hey, Mike. Hi. Everyone seemed to be surprised by the Arab Spring, and you mentioned during lunch how your organization and other NGOs on the ground did have some indications that something was coming and that something was loosening up. I was wondering if you can go into more detail what those indications were, what it looked like, and maybe what the cause may have been. Um, one of the other things, so that the WikiLeaks cables I think showed us is that uh, in December 2010, most U.S. missions in the Middle East said, you know, we've got this guy for the next 10 years. Ben Ali is going to be here. The Bahraini royal family is in place. No big changes coming. Um, and, you know, that's just a, if anyone's a foreign or a retired foreign service officer here, it's not to negate the great work that they do. It's just that their role uh, is to interact with the government. And so, therefore, they operate in this bubble. They're protected and shielded inside the embassy walls. And then the only person they interact with is the government of that country. So uh, they don't understand a lot of time the ferment that's going on out there. But I think groups like ours that are working, uh, you know, at a grassroots level and working outside of Cairo and working in the regions, we start to see things that are a little bit different. And among those things we were talking about today was... Uh, I can recall in Egypt, people were afraid to talk to us after 2005, 2006, when President Mubarak said, I don't want you guys here. But then around 2009, these people that we were taking from Cairo to Amman to do campaign training, they'd get calls at the hotel in Jordan from the secret police back in Cairo saying, you know, you're in big trouble, you're not supposed to be there. And they'd basically say, you know, you don't scare me, and they'd just hang the phone up on them. Or they'd go back and actually be picked up at the airport and taken in for questioning. And, you know, they were not afraid anymore. And so that's one of the signs that you see is suddenly people aren't afraid. And it doesn't always mean they're going to take to the streets, but suddenly people aren't afraid. And I think we saw a little bit of this even in a, in a way with Vladimir Putin this, uh, a few months ago when he said... Uh, sort of in a very casual, cavalier way. Yeah, it's all worked out. Medvedev is stepping down, and I'm going to be the president again. And he said this in advance of elections. And I think that kind of is what has brought all these Russians suddenly back into the streets, tens of thousands. They're just being treated this cavalierly, like your vote's not even going to matter. We've worked it all out ourselves. And so I think you start to find people get frustrated. They get fed up. But the key thing is they're not afraid anymore, and they're not afraid to accept help and identify that, you know, they want to see change in their country. Tom Garrett, thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, give me a hand. Thank you.